Good morning and welcome to our online worship service for the Aurora Bradshaw and Phillips United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Michelle Reed and my husband Greg and I co-pastor all of these churches and welcome you to our worship time together for this weekend or this week or whenever it's convenient for you to watch and visit and connect with God and our church connections at the same time. A few announcements to get us started off this week. First of all, here at the Aurora Church, we will be celebrating our confirmation service Finally, that should have happened last April, um, we will be honoring those confirmands and bringing them in in the membership of the church on August 30th at 9 a.m. at the Aurora Church. So if you'd like to be present for that, you're certainly welcome to come. And uh, we will also do our best to make sure that gets on Facebook Live so that some of you who are not attending in person yet would be able to participate in that way and celebrate a, a joyous confirmation class. So uh, put that on your calendars August 30th. Um, last night here in Aurora, our uh, safety team is kind of what I call them. Our group of the chairs of the administrative committees met to talk about some possible moving forward with some different ways that we have been worshiping here at the Aurora building. Um, we did make some decisions that I want to pass on to you this morning. First of all, that it remains our policy to continue to require masks and social distancing as you are worshiping in the building. Masks definitely when you are walking or moving around the building. Once you're seated in the sanctuary and stationary, it's up to you. If you'd like to take your mask off, you are welcome to do so as long as you are distanced from others. And if you have been here lately, you know that we have some red felt that marks off areas where you should not sit so that you can be distanced all around the sanctuary. And as we uh, move forward, we're deciding that we're going to add a couple of things back into worship that we have been greatly missing in in-person worship. And that is, first of all, our singing. Um, there's many different opinions and studies and experiences of singing in church, not only in our community, but around uh, the United States and around the world. What our team has decided is that we'd like to begin to sing in worship. Um, and, and so we will begin doing that the Sunday after Labor Day, which is the 13th. And that we will be able to do that, probably be singing at the end of the service so that um, once we've sung, people exit the sanctuary, we close the doors and then it's empty um, probably until the next week. So that as we are maybe uh, expressing those aerosols, that that gives the, any chance of virus to kind of dissipate in between services. Masks will be required while singing. I will say that if you want to sing, along in church, then you do have to keep your mask on. And, and we would suggest that you're not singing to impress the back row or the front row or wherever you're sitting. Sing um, as it fills your spirit um, quietly and so that we're not um, spreading too much aerosols out into the sanctuary. But we feel like we have a large enough space that we can begin to do this as I said, on Sunday the 13th. So look forward to that in adding that to our worship time. The second thing we're looking forward to adding is on that same Sunday, the 13th of September, is a fellowship time. And I know many of you have been wanting that and looking forward to that time so that after worship, once we leave the sanctuary, we can come into the fellowship hall and we will have a, a safe, distanced way for us to be in fellowship. Again, masks while you're moving around the building, but we're anticipating setting up tables and seating a few people at each table. Once you're seated, once you have your coffee, uh, you can be seated and then visit at that table with those persons. And so um, we're preparing for that. And saying all that reminds me to let you know that that could change. Uh, as you well know, we are practicing flexibility and if cases go up again or some unforeseen thing happens, those plans may change. But for now, our plan is to begin singing and fellowship time on Sunday, September 13th after the Labor Day weekend. The 
Other uh, main thing we talked about was how to bring back children and youth events to the Aurora Church, and we're very much looking forward to doing so. Uh, although we are not starting Sunday school classes for children yet, um, we are going to um, plan to have our Wednesday evening Rejoice, Connect for Five, and youth groups. The way we're doing that is to have an outdoor event for children on September 9th, the Wednesday after Labor Day. It will be completely outdoors and distanced and masks will be required for some things and maybe not for others. We haven't talked too much about the details, but uh, we will definitely have activities for kids outdoors and that will be a chance for families to come and indicate their uh, registration for the, the season, the rest of the fall season uh, of Rejoice and Connect for Five. And so we will be there to celebrate with our kids. Looking forward to that greatly. And we have uh, to assure that social distancing and safety happens on Wednesday evenings with our children and youth. We are going to be renting the 4-H building at the fairgrounds here in Aurora and splitting our groups between the church building and the fellowship hall here and the 4-H building at the fairgrounds so that we have enough room uh, for all our children and youth to gather safely and distanced and still come together and continue to grow in their faith and add to their religious background and add to that foundation that that our families have been building so far with our kids, teaching them the basics of our faith, helping them to grow in Christ. It's such an important thing for our children to have that foundation of belief and values as they start out their journey of life. So we're hoping to be able to offer all of that to you uh, beginning after Labor Day weekend. Again, we'll be flexible. If something happens um, before then that um, prevents that from happening, we will communicate that with you as best we know how. But for now, that's our plan and we're very excited to be doing those things. Also very excited to continue our building project. Um, we, we do have completed the TLC room, which is a great joy. And uh, once we have our new building in place, we hope to not have to use a fairgrounds and, and other facilities, but be able to do everything right here on the church grounds. A couple of the things I want to say about all of that. Um, first of all, I mentioned that we're not having children's Sunday school at this time. The third graders, uh, some of you are wondering how your third graders are going to learn about their Bibles. We are incorporating that into our Wednesday evening program, and you will be uh, getting information about that soon if you are a parent or family member of a third grader. Also, adult Sunday school classes. We'd like to invite each leader of the Sunday school classes that are adults to communicate with your Sunday school members and invite them if they are willing and feel safe to do so to come and can begin meeting at the church for Sunday school classes. There may be some different areas that we're using or ways that we're doing that, but we do encourage Sunday school classes, adult classes to, to begin to meet on the church grounds in the Aurora Church. Uh, this coming week, uh, the Bradshaw Church Council's meeting. Tonight, the Phillips Church Council is meeting, so we will be making decisions about those two, two churches, and we'll share some of that information with you as it comes. We will continue to provide online worship, whether that's pre-recorded or as we make some changes, maybe it's time to go back to a go to a video of what we are doing in the sanctuary or one of our sanctuaries. We'll, we'll think about those things, but we will continue to offer worship to you in every way possible so that we can reach as many people that would come and want to hear and be inspired and connect with God and Jesus Christ. Those are all the announcements I have for you this morning. Um, and now I would like to invite you to uh, join us in an opening song, one that reminds us that each day God's mercies are new and each day uh, we celebrate the re resurrection of Christ around us in nature and in our lives. Would you join me in singing, Morning Has Broken?
It's the Mary and Martha Show. This is the story of two sisters. Their brother was Lazarus. Martha and Mary were their names. Once to their house Jesus came. Yes, Jesus loved them. Yes, Jesus loved them. Yes, Jesus loved them. The Bible tells us so. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Mary, Mary, we have a lot of food to cook. We have a lot of guests. Could you come in the kitchen and help? Can the blind lead the blind? Will they both fall into the pit? The student is not above the teacher. All these footprints are leaving a lot of mud. Mary, uh, <clears throat> Mary, could you help me please? But everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say? Mary, Judas has been in the bathroom again. I could use some help. How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work? Would you tell her to help me, please? Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. As it comes to our time for joys and concerns, I want to lift up a couple of things for you. First, the joy uh, I mentioned during the announcement time that our uh, building plan and proposal and project in the TLC preschool room is complete, and so that has been a great joy. Look for in your newsletter some information and a couple of pictures of what has happened over there. And uh, we'd love to show you what's going on, but we're very excited to have that work completed. Another check off of the list in our building project. And we, again, appreciate all of you who continue to send in your pledges and your resources so that we might continue our building project even at this time. We're very, very grateful to all that uh, you all are doing to support the ministry of the church. And we look forward to the time where we can continue to move forward and be back together all again at one time and in one place. I would also like to uh, lift up a couple of things around the country that are going on that I would ask for prayers for. One of those is the continuing prayers for the people of Iowa, especially those who are, have lost farm, uh, have lost crops. Uh, when the derecho went through, we wanna lift up our nation as we experience the effects of whatever those losses are going to be on our country. Um, that's a, a major amount of cropland that was ruined and wasted. Also continuing to pray for all of the people who have lost homes or businesses. Um, in that terrible, terrible storm. And so we want to lift those uh, our neighbors in Iowa up for, for prayer. Also, uh, to the west of us, um, Colorado and California, uh, those two for sure are experiencing wildfires like crazy right now. And the danger of that continues uh, throughout the next few weeks. Uh, we just would lift up uh, all our people of our country, that we might be united, that we might care for one another, lift one another in prayer, and be supporting one another in whatever way we can. Uh, a hope for unity is certainly a theme I have heard multiple times 
uh, this season. And I, I would echo that prayer that as we uh, enter into an election season, that we would maintain unity, see one another as people who love our country, no matter what side of the aisle you stand on, that each one of us wants the best for our country and that we seek you, you to be united, the United States of America. And so I will be praying for our leadership and our government and, and the election teams and all of those folks in the, in the weeks and months to come. Won't you join me now? I'm going to pray offering, first of all, a moment of silence, and then I'll offer a prayer and then invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Will you bow your heads with me? Holy God, whether we are at home, isolated, quarantined, and apart from others, or out in the community, masked, or worried, or just moving along, feeling uh, grateful for being a part of a community that cares, we ask that you would lift each and every one of us up to you and your spirit and your son, Jesus Christ. God, we are grateful that we are one church, the body of Christ, lived out in many ways. We are reminded of Paul's great writing that as the body of Christ, we need each and every part of one another. The eye cannot say to the ear, I don't need you. We look at one another as persons, as whole human beings created by God, as children of God, and we know that we need each other. God, help us to be aware more than ever of our need to be unified and our need to see one another as the children of God and see the, the actual image of God in each other. As we look at other people, God, help us to see Christ in them, that we might open our hearts and our minds to them. Help us to be inspired by saints over the centuries and over the our, our span of life that have exemplified for us the gifts of hospitality, the gift of grace, the gift of kindness and of love. God, we are so grateful that we follow Jesus Christ. His way was the way of hospitality, forgiveness, and grace. And as we faithfully live in his footsteps, we ask that you would strengthen us to walk in the narrow way that leads to Christ, that rejects all other ways as ways that don't work for us. As we see that we don't need uh, material goods, we don't need success, we don't need a name for ourselves because our names are tied up in your name. And then in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, it's such a powerful thing to be connected to that name that leads us to your light and your will and your way. Holy God, I thank you for our church and wherever we are and however we are worshiping you, we are grateful that we have what we have, which is this connection in the spirit. Help us to understand it and to know that when one part of our church suffers, we all are suffering. When one part of our church rejoices, we all rejoice. Help us to navigate the path that is before us right now, the steps that we are taking right now every single day, and help us to be humble enough to know that we may not always get it right. God, we thank you for all of what we have offered you this day and in days to come. And we ask that you would hear our prayers for the people around us, for those who are suffering, those who are ill, those who are facing medical treatments, those who are still suffering from the virus, and those who may yet get it. We ask that you would rejoice and give thanks when we give thanks as well for all of our celebrations. God, we ask that you would hear us now in this prayer, in this time, as we offer you the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The next thing I'd like to invite you to do is to join us in another hymn. This is a song that invites the Spirit to come among us and move among us, the Spirit of the living God. Would you please join us as we sing? continue uh, a, a six-part series of messages that we've called the, the Book of Acts, the drama of the early church. Uh, but before we get to the scripture for this morning, I want to refer back to the last time that I shared a message with you, which was part of our series on the, on the Lord's Supper. Uh, not the Lord's Supper, I'm sorry, the Lord's Prayer. And in that, I was talking about forgiveness. And I, I wanted to mention it because that text there, the text that I use where Jesus, in answering Peter's uh, question, says, you don't forgive seven times, but you forgive 70 times. And as I pointed out then, that's the kind of scripture that sounds really nice in principle, but we have real questions about uh, what harm it might do if we try to put that in practice. And I mention it because the, the story that I'm going to share, the passage that I'm going to share from Acts in this message is actually has somewhat of that same problem. It sounds good in principle, but we have real questions about, about uh, how it plays out if we, if we try to apply it to our own lives. So the, the passage is from the fourth chapter of Acts, beginning with the 32nd verse. I invite you to listen for the word of God. The community of believers was one in heart and mind. None of them would say, this is mine, about any of their possessions, but held everything in common. The apostles continued to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and an abundance of grace was at work among them all. 
There were no needy persons among them. Those who owned properties or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds from the sales, and place them in the care and under the authority of the apostles. Then it was distributed to anyone who was in need. Joseph, whom the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, that is, one who encourages, was a Levite from Cyprus. He owned a field, sold it, brought the money, and placed it in the care and under the authority of the apostles. So there's the rub. In this scripture, in very positive language that expressed to us this is exactly what the Christian community should have been doing. It says that all of the people of the community sold the property that they had, gathered up the proceeds from that, from that sale, offered it to the apostles who were leading the community, and then all of that was shared amongst the entire community. That sets off all kinds of alarm bells for people. If you start to suggest that this would be the goal of any God-fearing Christian community, that we would all be willing to share communally everything that we have, that we would have no private property, but all of it would be shared equally for the good of everyone, you're going to run into massive amounts of resistance. You're going to get get the, the, the arguments that say, if people can't own in some way, if people can't can't bear the fruits of their own labor, but everybody just gets equal, then there's no motivation. And there's certainly some truth in that. There's certainly going to be some abuse of this system. There's going to be people that, that are just going to decide, hey, I don't have to do anything because they're going to make sure that everything I want is taken care of. And even if you if you tend in your own understanding of the economic world, tend toward a, 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 a version that says we ought to strive to share things more equally, in this passage is still built some things that would be of concern for you in that the power in this, in this economy that's, that's projected in this scripture takes the power out of the hands of individuals and hands it over to just a few people. It's not a, a democratic get together and all work together, but it's here. I've given up everything that I have. You take it and you make all the decisions. It says it's handed over to the apostles. So in the end, as much as it has a, an appeal to the idea that, that this could happen, it's it's at best often considered utopian, and at worst, it is sometimes abused. I'm just at the, at the age where I, I vividly remember the news stories of the, the Jim Jones um, tragedy in which he used this text in order to, to gather the money as, as, as many who have professed a building a Christian community, they get people to sell all they have so that they can gather in all of that for their own good and, and, and for nefarious purposes. And, and of course, that came to a, a, a tragic end. But also, more commonly, this is a, a, a scripture that's simply discarded. It's, it's utopian, it's, it's impractical, it's, it's destructive, it's, it's unfair, it's anti-motivational and, and all kinds of things, and none of which are entirely wrong. But I think there's too much value in understanding this, too much of what it means to be a core Christian, a, a, a community that has, has Christ at its core, to disregard this and always look to other passages for guidance and inspiration. So as I was thinking about this 
in, in preparation for this message, a, a, a phrase, sort of a, a flippant little phrase kept coming into my mind. And that's that it's a very bad idea to bring a baseball bat to play in a football game. Now, there's nothing wrong with a baseball bat. A baseball bat is an extremely useful object when the goal is to strike a ball that is thrown in your direction out into a field of play in order to advance from base to base without before someone is able to retrieve the ball and tag you out or beat you to the, to the next base. That's a very good use of a baseball bat. But if you are playing a, a, a sport in which the idea is that we will have forcible collisions between people in order that one group of, of defensive players is attempting to prevent the offensive players from moving uh, the ball down the field. So if you enter into that with a baseball bat, that's not the kind of forcible contact that's going to be productive to the game or safe to the players. So when I look at, at, at this scripture and see, here is a community who was willing to sell all that they had, gather those possessions offer them to the leaders of their Christian community so that no one would be in need and it would be shared amongst everybody in the community. To me, understanding this and finding the value of it is first to put aside the practice of what they were doing, which was selling their property and sharing it with everyone in the community. That was something that was appropriate in their time. But times have changed. Another, another Christian practice that was very appropriate and very meaningful in its time that I absolutely, no matter how unchristian or unbiblical you want to call me, refuse to take part in. And that is the, the common Christian practice of foot washing. Quite frankly, it just gives me the heebie-jeebies. And it, it may do for you as well. And in this time of, of, of pandemic and all of the, the health things, we're all very conscious about clean and unclean and what we touch and, where, and, our, and our proximity to one another. It's even heightened. But the truth of, in its own time, when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples in this, in this act of, of humility and this act of, of being a servant, even though they saw him as their teacher, their rabbi, their master. This was a common practice for people to do, was to have their feet washed by others. Footwear was different, often open, and, and their feet were, were dusty and dirty. Our feet are are. are fungusy and wet and moist and sweaty. That's a whole different kind of cleaning that I'm not going to participate. I'm going to invite you to do that for yourself, then I'll do that for myself. Because the practice is just foot washing. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, it was really about his willingness, even as the Son of God, to be their servant. So in this case, this selling of property is just a practice. It's a, it's a way of, of, of doing their economic life together. But it's not necessarily the practice that fits into the world in which we live. What is central in this story is the, the, the purpose and the values that this community expressed in this. The value is laid out there right at the, at the very beginning. In these first two lines, in the, in the 32nd verse, 
The community of believers was one in heart and mind. None of them would say, this is mine. First of all, and, and most importantly, they were of one heart and mind. Now, that didn't mean they didn't have any, any disputes about practices, about how they do things, about how they use their resources, about what the responsibilities of everybody in the community was and how they would form and shape themselves. But they did that in one heart and one mind. They had to trust each other that they could be of one heart and one mind. And in broad terms, we would say it was in the heart and the mind of Jesus Christ, that revelation of the heart and mind of God. And so that meant that they were always searching for a way to express themselves as being a people who were together in that one spirit of God, together in the mind of the head of the church that was Jesus Christ. And this next phrase, which, which really is, is much more tied to the property, but still has, has value, they wouldn't say, this is mine. To really have the heart of Jesus Christ is to say, this life isn't mine. These things aren't mine. And it's, I've, I've given messages and, and Bible studies talking about, you know, we, the things that we earn. We, we get caught up in, I, I earned this. I worked hard for this. I, 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 I had the, the plan and, and put all of this together and made this happen. So this is mine. And I, I, I've talked about all of the things that God gave you that, that were the resources that allowed you to manipulate them in that particular way and come to that conclusion. But if we're talking about being in the, in the mind of, of, of Jesus Christ, it's almost a conversation about the, 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 the commandment that says, don't have idols, don't have other gods. Which is to say, it's not about me, it's not about what, what, what is mine. I'm not going to make a, an idol out of the thing that I have created the thing that I have achieved. And I'm not going to, to idolize and worship my creativity and my ability to make that happen. But I'm going to do these things in order that the God would be glorified, that the good news of Jesus Christ would be revealed. As it says in verse 33, the apostles continued to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the abundance of grace was at work among them all. That it's not about what's mine. It's about being of the mind of Christ so that the things that I do, the things that I have, the things that I have achieved are bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's not about the practice of, of selling your property and handing that over to the Christian community that says, this is not mine, or that I'm one heart and mine with the rest of the community. That is a practice that was appropriate at the time for a people who didn't understand economic life the the way we do, that didn't have the opportunity to, to have personal property for all people in the, in, in the way that, that we understand it, that weren't used to democratic processes where power was shared amongst all of the people. So for them to devote all that they had to a leader that they trusted, who thought was being faithful to God's will, that was something that was a, a, a much more natural expression of their love of God and their devotion to the Christian community. That would be very foreign and could easily be destructive to the Christian community in which we live. 
but that core value to say that we will be of one heart and mind, the, the, the mind of Jesus Christ, the heart of God, the, the bonded by one spirit. And then to be in this, in, 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 in solidarity of one purpose. And this is where economics really do come into it. Because we tend to fall on these fault lines of economics of, of, of how much we share, how much, what is the best way to, to, to do it, whether it's, you know, more free market and you, you get what you earn and, or whether we need to be more supportive of those people who, who perhaps don't have the same opportunities that we have. And, and so we balance these things. And it would be pure ego of me to, to tell you, well, this is the side of this spectrum that you should fall on. Because there's, there's all kinds of complexities and issues that, that fall into that. But this I can say with, with all of the confidence of my Christian faith is that regardless of what practices of economy, what practices within the economics of our church, of our home, of our nation, of the world, as a Christian community, our purpose should be, in the end, to be able to say that there was no one in our community that was in need. That whether it's it's economy from the, the bottom up or from the top down. That in the end, we only apply ourselves and our efforts to that economy whose ultimate purpose is that no one in our community will be of need. So this scripture isn't about an encouragement for us to sell all that we have. But it is an encouragement to say, to, to stop holding on to saying, this is mine. These are my things. This is my life. But that we enter into Christian community together to be of one heart, to be of one mind, the mind that is the mind of Jesus Christ. And that our purpose is that no one in our community would be in need, whether that is economic, spiritual, whatever those needs are, that that is our ultimate purpose as the people of God living in this life. So that in the end, we can do as the scriptures say and continue to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So we're going to, our, our, our concluding hymn this morning is one that at various times in my, in my years we, we've sung as our, as our closing to a different worship service. So I've had times when we sang it every week, but it's particularly, I think, poignant in this moment in which there are deep divisions in our societies and societies all over the world where we have challenging decisions and, and people have, have tended to become more entrenched in their positions and more willing to, to demonize the other. So it is a simple tune, Shalom to you, offering peace, not just for me, but to all of you. So let us sing together.
together with one heart and one mind bear powerful witness to the to the glory and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, hope of the world. Amen.